Bingo. We do global co co connections every Thursday at uh, 1 o'clock. And today we're modifying that to global historical connections, okay, with our favorite history professor, uh, John Davidan of HPU. And we're talking about... Jay. Yes. Thomas Jefferson Esquire. Pardon me. President of the United States. President Trump. of the United States. It, it may look like John David Ann, but in fact, today, especially for this show, you can tell by the garb, he is Thomas Jefferson, President of the United States. Indeed. It's very important that we understand Thomas Jefferson because that helps us understand, oh, lots of stuff that happened since and maybe even happening now. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. So what was life good, good, like, Thomas? Good day, sir. Do you mind if I call you Thomas, or would you like me to call you Mr. President? Mr. President Thank or you. Colonel would be fine. Or Colonel or Esquire. Yes, Esquire <laughs> would work as well. You know, you, you know, you're a very creative guy. You did, uh, what was it, Mount, Mount Vernon there in Virginia? Monticello. Beautiful. Monticello, yeah. And um, it's, um, you know, you left a, an enormous uh, imprint on the beginnings of the country. Uh, when, when, you know, things like that, cast a long shadow, a 200-year shadow. Mm. Uh, what kind of a person are you, Mr. President? Well, indeed, I love to read. I love to drink good wine. Uh, my book collection is uh, its one of the best in the world. Um, but also, I like to run my plantation. Yeah, with slaves. I was, I was, Sir, indeed, <laughs> slaves. Yes, slaves. Yes, of course, slaves. Yes. Ah, the issue. Always the issue of slaves. I hear now you don't have slaves. <laughs> not, not anymore. Ah, yes. Probably a good move. I was in favor of it myself. Although I have to admit I never did free my slaves, not even in my will. I thought about it. But I did free a few select slaves. The Hemings. The Hemings were really unusual for the, the duskier race, the, the African race. They were so smart and competent and skillful. They made me a small fortune on my plantation. Yeah. Indeed, and very attractive as well. Where would a slave go in, say, the year 1800 if you freed a slave in 1800? Would he stay in Virginia? Would he go north? What would happen? Well, I should have hoped that a slave would stay on my plantation ah. and work for wages. Ah. Uh, although I'm not sure I could have made a profit at that. The slaves gained me about 4% per annum, ah. and that 4% would have gone away if I had to pay them. Now, I did pay slaves a tiny bit. Now, in any event, as no, slaves. No, and again, once in a while, yes, I rewarded my boys who made nails in my nail shop because it was indeed very profitable for a small time. Oh, yeah. uh, and, uh, of course... My butler received a Christmas present from me every Christmas, and of course, Sally Hemings, the beautiful Sally Hemings, received all kinds of gifts from me. Ah. So you were gentry, gentry, you were kind of like an aristocrat in those days. You were wealthy, landed. But not a European aristocrat. What's the difference? A natural aristocrat. Natural. What's a, a natural aristocrat? A, an ar aristocracy of merit, uh, gained by, by hard work, by intellect, by superior breeding, but not European breeding, a very important distinction. My, oh my, the European aristocracy I hear is gone, completely gone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> decadent, decaying, uh, full of it corruption. Won't last. It won't last. <laughs> a natural aristocracy, on the other hand, can uh. last forever because it's based upon the wisdom of the ages. Uh. So what's your family background, Mr. President? Well, indeed, I, I was born into wealth. It's no secret. Um, and I was raised, I was well-educated in the classics. Yes, that's true as well. I was uh, trained as a lawyer. Where'd you uh, go to school? I went to William and Mary as a young man. Of course. It, it, an excellent Beautiful university. School. I hear that the university is still there. The heart and of in, Virginia. And in fact, I founded a university myself, the University of Virginia. Ah. Endowed them with books. Ah. Sold my collection to the Library of Congress to reconstitute ah. it in 1814 after, the, after the, uh, the British Army destroyed it in the so, War of 18. So you had interests in many things, uh, you know, in coming up and getting trained. It was not, it was not only in the classics 
It was in science, such as science existed Indeed. at the time. Indeed. You and Dr. Franklin had something in common. Indeed, yes. We, I was an experimenter myself. I had a writing machine at my desk, which would automatically give copies. When I wrote one copy, it would make a second copy. <laughs> <No kidding>. Very <laughs> clever invention. I had hydraulically opening doors at Monticello. <laughs> so, very interested in science, interested in agronomy, interested in in the races the different races i have very wide interest philanthropy philosophy um those my interests have been very wide indeed now did you did you come up through uh, association with george washington uh what was your connection no, with him no i did not i was uh, i was kind of a self-made man that way ah. um, i came up through the virginia legislature ah. assembly uh, and then during uh, the War of Revolution, I was picked, I was chosen to write the Declaration of Independence. And this made you a famous person rather well, than 13 in, colonies. Indeed, I think the ideas were there, and I think they're very important to us even today. If we are a nation, we should be a nation of the Declaration of Independence. Well, did, was, those were your ideas, I take it, that you had those ideas and you were in a position where you could express them in that document. Indeed, now. indeed. I, I had some experience with, with uh, phlo Enlightenment philosophy, and, and I believed in the liberty of the individual mm -hmm. as the, 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 the basic building block of the American. The All American. men are created equal? Exactly. Exactly. Yes, indeed. indeed. So now, between the revolution and the writing of the uh, Declaration of Independence, um, what happened to you, and how did you wind up running for president in right, 1800? Right, right. So I was I was chosen to be minister for France in the 17 late 1780s, and then I was the first Secretary of State under George Washington. Although Washington associated himself with lower characters, a man named Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, you might know him, scoundrel that he was, philanderer, liar. See, indeed, oh, he brings out the, the, the vile in me as well. Yeah, he's well known on Broadway these days. So Hamilton and I disagreed. We disagreed about the basic character of the American government. Uh -huh. Hamilton wanted a big government, a big military, uh -huh. a strong president. Uh -huh. He argued that the president should serve for life oh, in the Constitutional like Convention. Like a monarch. Yes, although he, his ideas were overthrown, thank goodness for that. Uh, I favored the Bill of Rights. I favored limited government, a weaker central government, more rights to the states, and individual rights. I argued for this in my law press, pr uh, practice. I argued for this in the Declaration of Independence, and then I argued against Hamilton that we should not build ourselves a tyranny, which indeed will eventually corrupt us beyond help. So you were an important architect of the whole system and the Constitution. You were a central figure in bringing well, in these ideas. Am I right? Don't be modest now. Well, oh, I, I wouldn't be modest, sir. <laughs> really, these are my accomplishments. Although I was in France during the Constitutional Convention, I encouraged Madison and others to think very seriously about a Bill of Rights. This, to my mind, was the essential missing feature to the original Constitution. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, we in Virginia pushed very hard for the passage of the Bill of Rights in 1790, and it became an essential part of the Constitution. And indeed, apparently, it, it perseveres even to today. Oh, it has become very important, Mr. President. Mm. Oh, yes. Indeed. So 1790 to, say, 1800, what did you do with yourself? Well, I was governor of Virginia for a time, and I did some writing, and uh, I was a gentleman farmer. Mm -hmm. Were you popular in the public eye? Well, it depends on which public eye you're referring <laughs> to. Of course, the Federalists hated me. Ah. But the Jeffersonians named after, I might say, the Democratic Jeffersonians uh, loved me. And there were more of them. Well, it was a very tight election. So in the election of 1800, I decided to put my name in, and John Adams, who had been the president, uh, was running for re-election. And it was a very close, hard-fought election. Adams only had had one term up to that point. That's correct. And as to the accusation that I called Adams a hideous hermaphrodite, I did not. There was a newspaper man named James Callender who 
who wrote this of, of Adams, I was sorry for it. As to the accusation that I hired James Callender to do this, well, if it were true, then surely I would not have approved of such language. But I will say that I myself was attacked. This same scurrilous journalist uh, accused me of fathering five children with a slave, Sally Hemings. Now, if that were true, I should say that those slaves deserve to be freed, and I did indeed free those okay. slaves upon my death. Sounds like one vicious campaign it there was, in 1800. It was a very nasty campaign, which ended up in the House of Representatives. Oh, is that and right? And my arch enemy, Hamilton, yeah. supported me, and I found myself elected president. Wow. Indeed, it was quite an exciting well, time. Those were the heady times, because the, the country really hadn't come to come to terms with its new government. It was still very early in the United, the development of the United States. The United States. States was a small peripheral place in the world. Yes. Uh, the European powers threatened us here and there. Uh, Hamilton and, and Adams favored England in the war, the Napoleonic Wars. I favored France. Napoleon was a friend, a protector of liberty, a builder of civil rights and civil institutions. I aimed in my presidency to strengthen the hand of the American government. Therefore, we bought the Louisiana Purchase. Mm -hmm. uh, we de defeated the Barbary Pirates with our new Navy. And I must say, I thank John Adams for that Navy because it was indeed his initiative, mm -hmm. even though I opposed it at first. <laughs> As president, I became, uh, shall we say, more in love with central government and the powers of the presidency. Did you advance them and expand them? Not in that kind of way, but indeed with the uh, the executive power of commander-in-chief, I sent the fleet to the Mediterranean. I'll take credit for that. Yeah. Yes. In those days, uh, when you send a fleet, do you have to have congressional approval, or can you just do it as commander-in-chief? I, I did it as commander-in-chief. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so this, you know, that was a very formative period. You served eight years. Indeed. From 1800 or 1801 to 18, uh, 1809. 1809. Yes. Um, how would you say the country changed, you know, uh, you know, in, t in terms of on the way to manifest destiny, ah. and the coming together of the 13 colonies, the right. expansion right. looking west, what happened? Well, the Louisiana Purchase allowed us to move west, sure. to settle west. You got that cheap, didn't you? I, I, it was an inexpensive purchase, that's correct, and it has served the country for centuries afterwards. I negotiated treaties with the native chiefs. Uh, they called me the Great Father, and I found it to be so. And uh, we, we expanded our holdings in the southern states as well into the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, but the, the strengths of the nation were offset by this new conflict which came about towards the end of my life over slavery, slavery in the new territories. I had bought the Louisiana Purchase with the set idea that slaves could certainly be in the southern parts of this Louisiana Purchase, but never in the north. Uh, but uh, innovators suggested now that we should have slaves in the north as well. Uh, well, and the Louis Louisiana Purchase didn't go that far north, did it? It went fairly far north, yes, it, it did. did, actually. Yes. Covering current states of what? Into, into, uh, uh, into North Dakota and, oh. uh, yes, South oh, Dakota. Oh, huge, yes. all the way yes. to the Canadian border. Oh, yes, then. it was. A, it, it was, was the a, first great acquisition going west. It was sizable. Yeah, sizable yeah. bit of so land. This, this was going to define that's correct. where slavery would go. That's correct. And, and the ultimate decision was on slavery in Well, the I purchase. hear that there was a war, a <laughs> civil war, and that those who opposed slavery won said war. Yeah. Therefore, I think it's a good thing. It enhances our liberty to not have slaves. Yes. Yes. It, it makes us closer to the document that I wrote, the Declaration of Independence. So in that period when you were president, uh, 1801 to 1809, uh, were you able to advance the Bill of Rights? Were you able to get people to, to come to your way of thinking on a popular basis? Well, we mostly got rid of the Alien and Sedition Acts, mm. which I thought violated the, the Bill of Rights. These mm -hmm. were the acts which allowed the president to jail anyone who criticized the federal government. Ah, sedition. Uh, yes, I got rid of most of them. I kept one because of the conflicts in Europe. I decided that if a person from a hostile nation came and made bad intentions toward the United States, then we, had, we should have the right to jail them. 
Uh, but a local person of somebody coming from another nation, from a hostile nation. But, but, but somebody who was not, a lo uh, not coming from a foreign nation. Well, it could be if that person was an agent of a hostile okay. nation, in yes. which, in fact, we had. Wait, wait, those were time difficult period. times, That's yeah. That's correct. And uh, these, are, these are interesting times, <laughs> I would say. And uh, when we come back from this break, uh, Mr. President, yes. Thomas Jefferson, yes. looks just like uh, John David Ann of ah, HBU. I've uh, never heard of the, the man, but uh, he must be quite a historian. We're, we're going to have uh, President uh, Jefferson uh, discuss uh, how he would feel, what he would think of what's going on today. Ho -ho. We'll be right back after this break. I bet you can't wait. <laughs> Aloha. My name is Carl Campagna. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I hope you join us as we take a deep dive into biofuels in Hawaii over the coming weeks and the alternative fuel supply chains necessary for the local and global transition towards transportation fuel sustainability. We are going to invite in and we will have significant interviews with various stakeholders, including our producers, which are our farmers, and our scientists, our conversion technologies, including Terviva, who we'll see in two weeks, as well as our consumers. Uh, within there, we're also going to have the investor groups necessary to make sure that this uh, can advance. So I do hope you join us as we explore our deep dive into biofuels in Hawaii. We're back, we're live, and we're not kidding. <laughs> this is um, Global Historical Connections uh, with John David Ann, who looks a lot like Thomas Jefferson today. I like your outfit. Yeah. President, uh, President Jefferson. President Thomas Jefferson. Thank Let's be you, thank you, correctly sir. Kind respectful sir. about this. You've been so yeah. kind. Yes, you sir. must. Yes, sir. You must call me. By <laughs> so, <clears throat> at the moment, you know, you left office. Uh, well, how long did you live after 1809? I lived until 1826, yeah. and the same day as John Adams. Ah, death. Interesting. We died hours apart. And yes. we reconciled as friends. Yes. I no longer considered him a, 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 a hermaphrodite. <laughs> and, and we reconciled. We wrote letters to one another. <laughs> Very nice. So, so there you, you left this long shadow on the United States. Um, what, what uh, and this is a hard question for only mm. a half an hour discussion, Indeed. but what effect did that shadow have? as we go forward, say from uh, 1826 to uh, 2016. Yeah, so uh, in today's world, I think we have, uh, the way I see it, we have two choices. We have the Hamiltonian choice of bigger government, mm -hmm. stronger government, larger military. Mm -hmm. um, I hear that the United States has quite a role in the world these days. Oh, yeah, like a yeah. superpower is the term that I've heard. I yeah. read widely <laughs> all of the newspapers. <laughs> And so, if the United States is a superpower, then it's a Hamiltonian superpower. Mm. And that scurrilous figure <laughs> has endangered the Republic by exposing us to all of these corrupting and defining and defaming influences from the outside world. We should, we should just uh, focus on our own selves. We then. have always been our best when we have been a Republic. Yes. Not some sort of an empire. Yes. Or if we are to be an empire, as I told my native friends at one point in a presidential speech so long ago, we are to be an empire of liberty, not an empire of doom or an empire of, of hegemony, an empire of liberty. Well, in the Jeffersonian world, and you know, as carried forward, I think probably you would agree that it has changed. Indeed. What, are the, what are the duties of the citizen? What do you expect the citizen to do? Uh, what is the relationship of the citizen and the government, whether it's a big government or a little government? Indeed, so the citizen is so important to our republic. Uh, the, the citizen farmer in my time was the key to understanding the Jeffersonian Republic because the farmer could exercise an independence that no other person in the republic could. The farmer was neither dependent for his wages upon a wealthy merchant or industrialist, the farmer could grow his own food, and so the farmer was the ultimate independent person. Therefore, that is what we seek in our citizens, to be independent and of strong character, a term that I would call having public courage, the ah. courage of one's convictions. Ah. I believe that I had a small bit of this yes. when I was yes. active in well, politics. In those days, uh, the, not everybody could vote. 
Uh, was there something about, uh, this is during your administration, indeed, indeed. that you had to be a landowner to vote? Yes, I, I hear now that they've expanded the franchise yes, oh, to yes. females. Is yes. this a good idea? True fact. Hmm. <laughs> I've pondered this. Maybe I should change my mind. <laughs> but yes, of course, uh, in our time, only wealthy landowners could vote. And, uh, and I think the reason for this, my fine sir, is that Wealthy landholders had the time to reflect, to think, to read, to study classics, to understand, and therefore should be granted that hallowed right of the running of the republic. Now, today, you have something that maybe is a mobocracy, a, a more dangerous sort of republic where everybody gets a vote. Some people do not read, do not understand. Indeed, indeed. But to counter that, we put in place what we call the electoral system. I'd like to talk about that. And the electoral system was designed so that men of conscience, men like myself who are well-educated and from the natural aristocracy, can make that final decision so that the states can indicate their preference through the legislature and later on through the individual vote. But the electors make the final decision, and they make a weighty decision indeed, and they must follow their conscience, mm. not any vote or any mob. So it's a balance. It's, a, it's another a check and balance. It's supposed to be. Yeah, it's supposed to be. It's but supposed to be. If I, if I told you that the popular vote was greater than the electoral college vote, for a given candidate mm, in this uh, election, in this in, recent election, in the, the twenty sixteen, um, you know, would you say this was consistent with Jeffersonian democracy, uh, well, or would you say that some th something had gone off the track? Well, as a rule, I do not like mobs. I do not like democracy, actually, as yeah, a rule. Yeah. But in this case, it seems that the electoral system is broken, because the fine men and I guess women who were serving as electors, did not vote their conscience, but simply voted for whomever the candidate was who received more votes in that particular state. Uh, this is an abominable situation and, and really augurs the decline of our democracy, Jay. Yes. Well, you know, you talked about the, the, uh, the vicious uh, campaign, uh, you know, the sort of the the, the street fight campaign of the uh, year 1800. Indeed. We've yeah. had a few since, since mm, you died, yes, Mr. I, President. I, I've read about that. Um, yes. And this, uh, this recent election was uh, pretty much a street fight, too, in, in the same indeed, way or worse. Indeed. Um, and, I, and I wonder, knowing all that we know collectively about mm. what happened mm. in this, this current campaign, what your thoughts are about uh, you know, the future of our democracy, uh, the sanctity of our Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. Mm. Indeed, I, it is my sincere hope that liberty prevails in, within this republic, in this, this great republic that I helped to create. Indeed, I hope that liberty prevails. Um, the enemies of liberty seem to have grown in their strength, their ability to manipulate the masses, and to appoint themselves through this to high positions. This, to me, is most dangerous to the republic and therefore i think that we should look back at the constitution and look back at the protections of the constitution and treat those protections in the bill of rights as sacred as a sacred part of our commitment our covenant to the nation let's assume that we're in trouble on this and we need to fix it in mm -hmm. some way mm -hmm. uh, and you you and others uh, you know created this incredible document never seen before uh, in the world mm. that is self-fixing. self, self -fixing. It's mm. a self-correcting mm. document. The Constitution. The Constitution. It's flexible Constitution. and it allows for people to make changes as necessary mm -hmm. to this comport part it, with the changing history yes, around yes. us. This part of it I didn't really approve of, but the, <laughs> the ability to amend it could be to corrupt it and destroy it. Of course. It. Of course. Of course. I hear that they freed the slaves through the Constitution. They gave women the right to vote through the Constitution. So it's an innovative Constitution, which concerns me in a way. But as long as we understand the protections therein, and apparently the 14th Amendment is a very good amendment, which protects the rights of individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, this I fully support. Since so here, here's, the, here's the thought, though. Assuming that things have gone off the track or things are jeopardized in some way, 
under this precious and incredibly important document, historically and for the country. What, what would you say, Mr. President, what, what steps should be taken in order to repair it, to conform it, to, to go back to those basic principles mm. that are, you know, in the uh, Declaration of Independence and, uh, and underlie the Constitution? How do we do that now? What's your advice, Mr. President? Are you suggesting that we are in the influence of a tyranny? Um, let's put that out as, a, as a, a possibility. If that were the case, then of course a tyrannical leader must be removed. And we have provision for that in the Constitution through the Articles of Impeachment. Mm -hmm. But tyrannies are very dangerous, and they will destroy the Republic if not taken care of completely. And they need not come just from a civilian leader, they can come from a military that's too powerful. A uh, religion that's too powerful, a bank that's too powerful. In the Declaration of Independence, I wrote not just about liberty, but I condemned the Bank of England, I condemned the monarch of England, and I condemned the Church of England. All of those were tyrannous, uh, tyrannous in our time. And again, uh, the, the, the corrupting influence of money could again be upon us in this republic mm. and destroy us. Mm. I hear tell that the new, the new president-elect has appointed billionaire upon billionaire to his cabinet. This, to me, could represent a corruption. What do they say? Um, bigots, bullies, and billionaires. Can mm. we afford to have them mm. in our cabinet? Mm. Mm. It sounds dangerous to me. Yes. It sounds like the beginning of a tyranny. But. Uh, but we, we, these, these officers mostly serve at the approval of the Congress. The Congress should be able to say no. Well, we depend on the Congress to do the right thing. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a question in recent years as to whether it does do the right thing for the right reasons. So, again, that, that may need mm -hmm. fixing. Mm -hmm. okay. And then we have a Supreme Court where uh, the Congress uh, will not uh, approve newly uh, appointed members of the Supreme Court appointed by the President. Um, is that what you had intended, that the Congress would simply refuse to consider uh, any candidate to the Supreme Court? Well, this has happened many times in our history, or so I have read, that the Supreme Court has not been at full capacity. The Congress is one of the, the areas of government, the three divisions of government, the Supreme Court, the Congress, and the Executive Branch. And so we designed the, the system so that these branches would have a check upon one another. If the Congress does not have a check, then the Supreme Court must exercise that checking power. Uh, the, the, our system will last as long as those checks are in place. Yes. But if, if, if Congress no longer represents a check upon the power of the executive branch, then that is indeed great of great concern. Yes. Oh, gee whiz, uh, sounds like uh, you wouldn't be entirely happy with what's going on these days. And if I tell you that, the, uh, the, that this expanded electorate with all these people voting, many more uh, you know, groups of people, many more people mm. uh, voting, uh, are only voting in small percentages, you know, 40% mm. maybe, or depending mm. on where you are in the country. Um, wh what about that? This goes back to the question of whether uh, the citizen has an obligation to support the government by voting, paying taxes, mm. whatever mm. else. What can we do, Mr. President, your advice, please? Mm. In fact, can you turn to camera one and mm. give the people your advice about performing their obligations as citizens under Jeffersonian democracy? Indeed, we must have courage in this time. This is the most important thing, is that we exercise public courage in favor of the Republic, not in favor of our own interests, not in favor of some petty project. Uh, not in favor of uh, some lover or some, some person who's beneath you. We must exercise independence and public courage in this time. For the common, for the common good, for the nation, for indeed, the Constitution indeed. as written, for the Declaration and the rights of, hum, of, of human beings. Thank you, Mr. President. I must say in closing that you look so much like John David Ann. It's indeed, really, I must it's, meet this man. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. Mm, he sounds like a very great individual. <laughs> he is indeed. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Indeed. <laughs> Aloha. All the best, Jay. <laughs>